Well, thanks, Shane, so much. Um, we do the stuff for Maccabi USA and for coaching and basketball because I love doing it. And whatever I get from it, I get I get more from it than I can ever give to it. So that's really uh, that's really the key to me. Um, before we get to our great guest, Ron Kaplan, as uh, I'm sure everyone on this call knows, today is International Holocaust Day. And um, we would be remiss as an organization if we did not um, take a moment. I actually work at a Quaker school now. Every, every week on Wednesday, we have what's called Meeting for Worship, where you sit there. And then if the mood strikes you, you talk and say something. So we don't need people to talk, but we have, a, a, I think we could have a quick moment of silence. Okay, great, thanks. I just wanted to throw in something too, because I looked it up and we hear things like this all the time that um, a, a survey that was just done in um, just, just in September, where they were asking people about basic Holocaust knowledge among adults under 40, one in 10 respondents did not recall ever even hearing the word Holocaust before. The survey was the first 50 state survey of Holocaust knowledge um, of millennials and what they call Generation Z showed respondents were unclear about the basic facts of genocide. 63% of those surveys did not know that 6 million Jews and other groups were murdered in the Holocaust. And over half of those thought the death toll was fewer than 2 million, which would still be a ridiculous, enormous amount. Um, there was over 40,000 concentration camps and ghettos established in World War II, but nearly half of the US respondents could not even name one of them. So as the saying goes, it's, it's up to us collectively and individually as a group to, as we say, uh, never forget. Education is the key. A lot of us were in Berlin in um, 2015 and um, incredible experience. And of course, when we go to Israel and we go to Yad Vashem, huge part of the program. So um, on this day, we can never forget and we must um, keep that torch uh, lit forever. Um, so with that, let's get to the program. So our guest today is Ron Kaplan. He's formerly a sports and features editor for the weekly New Jersey publication. He's a freelance writer. He does book reviews. He's mainly a baseball guy, but he's done other things in pop culture as well. Um, his work has appeared in publications like Baseball America, New York sports scene, Cleveland Plain Dealer, Metal Floss. I was going to ask you what that is. Forward Magazine, is that when you flush your, you read a book while you're flossing your teeth, Ron? Is that that one? <laughs> it's good bathroom reading, yeah. <laughs> uh, Forward Magazine, January Magazine, E Magazine, Irish America, and American Book Review, among many, many others. He's been the editor of the Society of American Baseball Research Bibliography Committee newsletter, which is now no longer. Um, he's written three books. The first, which we're going to get to, 5,001 baseball books you must read before. 500. 500, 500. 500 what did I say? 5,000. Oh, 501, sorry. We'll get to 5,000, that's the sequel. <laughs> and um, then one that we're our main topic today, the Jewish Olympics, of course, the history of the Maccabee Games, um, which came out two years later. And then he continued that two-year cycle with a book about legendary Jewish baseball player, Hank Greenberg in 1938, um, Hatred and Home Runs in the Shadow of War, which came out in 2017. He worked as a writer and editor for New Jersey Jewish News. He had a, a Kaplan's Corner sports blog as well. So Ron, from on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for willing to take part in this and welcome. And I just want to, before we go on, my first baseball book that I'll never forget, read it a million times as a little kid, was called Little Lefty by a, a writer named Matt Christopher, who I looked up and he's written more than 120 novels best-spelling sports writer for children and adults, but I loved Little Lefty as far as everything else. So um, welcome and tell us how that part of your life um, evolved. I'm sorry, which, which part are we talking about here? That how baseball and how you got into baseball, being a baseball writer. Uh, 
back in, I'm going to say 1992, I was still working for the American Jewish Congress in Manhattan. And uh, there was a lot of spare time, a lot of downtime. So being a big baseball reader, uh, I just started contacting cold, contacting publications to see if they were interested in any kind of baseball review. Uh, started with Sabre. Uh, then there are other scholarly, quote unquote, baseball journals like Nine, uh, Spitball Magazine, a couple of others. And uh, they were very open and willing to have, uh, have me review some books. It was a way to get free books at the time. I wasn't getting any money out of it, but I was getting a lot of books. So that was kind of cool. And uh, eventually that morphed into the blog, which I still operate now, Ron Kaplan's Baseball Bookshelf, which is now uh, entering its uh, third decade. Uh, and I, I think I can say without fear of contradiction that it's the oldest blog of that type, uh, which has also given me the opportunity to interview a lot of very interesting people, uh, authors, musicians, filmmakers, anyone who had anything to do with things you can literally put on a bookshelf. So even if they're involved in uh, memorabilia, things like that. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, when I was on the paper, uh, I approached them with uh, an idea about a uh, column about Jewish sports. Every week I was doing a small section on that, but as anyone who's involved in journalism knows, uh, over the past 20 years or so, traditional publications have been shrinking and shrinking. Uh, so the real estate, the amount of space in the paper uh, needed to be used for other things, including advertisements. So they suggested, what about doing a blog? So that's how the Kaplan's Corner blog evolved. And uh, the, the, if, if you want to hear the story about how the Olympic book came, that, that, that's also uh, an interesting thing. The, public, uh, the publishing house, Sports Publishing, originally contacted a friend of mine and asked him if he'd be interested in doing this book. And he said he didn't have the time, but he suggested me. So after a fairly brief discussion with them, that, that's how this was beshared. And that's how this fell into my lap. Um, when you decided you would do it, how huge of an undertaking did you think it would be? And how was it in the end, how was it in relation to what you thought it might be? Uh, it was pretty daunting because there's not a whole lot of readily available material. Uh, I was uh, in touch with uh, the Israeli component and they were very happy and willing to share what they had. But uh, one of the problems is that, especially early on, the record keeping was not, I guess, foremost in the thoughts of what, what they were doing here. Uh, it certainly wasn't on the level of the Olympics. Uh, and I had a lot of help. A lot of people gave me suggestions on, on who to speak with and put me in touch with uh, some of these people. Uh, Jeff was very helpful with, with his suggestions and uh, uh, talking to me about his experiences, as were other members, uh, team members and uh, officials and administrators. Uh, I was working on a pretty short deadline, but uh, fortunately they were very supportive at the paper. So I was able to work on the book while working at the paper. I mean, literally in the office, I had time to work on the book. Uh, obtaining uh, photographs was fairly easy. Uh, it's just a question of how much space uh, I, 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 looking back at the book, I'm, I'm a little, I, I don't want to say disappointed, but I wish I had been able to do more interviews rather than just report results, because that's where the real stories are, is the people who put aside the time and trouble, energy and money to participate in something like this. When you look back at it and you see how, how it went from, you know, a relatively small event in the beginning, um, and to the monster event that a lot of us know that it is today. Um, ha what's your perception of the evolution and all the stuff that it went through over, over these many years now? I, I'm flabbergasted. Uh, the, the progress, not only of the games, but remember the first couple of games were before Israel became a nation. So there were all those political issues to deal with. Uh, one of the other issues was 
not just the games, but in interviewing a lot of these people, it's their perceptions of Israel, especially uh, American people from the United States. Uh, they had never been, many of them had never been to Israel before, especially early on. And to hear their stories of, of how it impacted them when they got there emotionally, spiritually, was very moving in, in a lot of cases. Uh, a lot of these people were not uh, religiously Jewish, they were more culturally Jewish, but uh, especially a few of them, I mean, it's Hal Brody who was so taken with it, he made Aliyah. Uh, there's a swimmer who became a, a rabbi. He, he was so taken with the uh, religious aspects of Israel that he became a rabbi. Uh, and uh, I'm looking up his name right now. Daniel Graber uh, became a rabbi for the Maccabee teams in the, in the 90s. So everybody has a unique story, but there are components that are very similar, including that, that kind of grab that they felt when they stepped off the plane or whatever mode of transportation they took to get there. And most of the people on this call know something about this, but so the first games were, there was 390 athletes from 27 different countries. And when you look back to just this past one, 2017, 10,000 athletes, 85 countries. It certainly, we you know say it's the uh, third largest international sporting event. And um, when you're there and you're taking part in it, it's just a monstrous thing. Now, one of the first things you know, on the cover of the book and something that jumped out at me was in 1961 that the U.S. delegation brought the Catalan champion Rafer Johnson to be a part of the delegation. And there he is even on the cover of your book. And he remained in Israel and trained Israeli track and field athletes for, for multiple months after the game. I know he didn't have that much participation, but what do you think that might have meant just of giving, giving the event like that much more cachet as it was evolving into the you know, larger event that it was and more important event that it was becoming? Well, that, that's exactly the word I was going to use, cachet, because if you can get someone like this involved in what was then a relatively small event, I mean, like you say, much smaller than it is now, it, uh, it gives that sense of importance on the international scene. Uh, kudos to him for uh, getting involved in that. I'm sure it must have taken uh, a good deal of persuasion to, to get him there. And once he was there, for him to take the time to work with the athletes is also uh, says something about his character. So as the games were evolving, I noticed one thing I thought also interesting. In 1965, Carol Benjamin, who was one of the top ranked USA fencers, and this goes to the, uh, the classic Jewish stereotype of unathletic and just studying and that kind of thing. But she said she, she arrived in Israel and was totally shocked what she saw. She was exploding all the stereotypes of Jewish men as little old guys in, in beards and Taluses and yarmulkes running around. She says, I, what I saw was young people and young soldiers in khaki pants and shorts and doing all kinds of athletic demonstrations. And then she said her whole impression of what Jewish men were changed and how striking it was to her. I think probably so many people probably had that experience. Well, yeah, especially at that point when the games were still, again, relatively small. And a lot of these people, at that point, uh, Israel hadn't been around that long. So I don't know what kind of education uh, school Hebrew schools uh, were giving about Israel, let alone uh, public schools. Uh, she's a very interesting uh, figure because 28 years after she participated in that event as a, as a fencer, she was on the half marathon team. So that, that's, I don't know if there's anyone else who had that gap in there for uh, participating in the games. Yeah, it's great. So the, one of the fascinating parts of the book, I thought, besides the history overall, was, um, was you, you had pages of just profiles of some of the people, you know, not just USA people, but some other people. The first one that struck out to me was the one about Joseph Gary, who was the only representative of Japan um, as a judo athlete in 1973. So uh, can you talk about him a little bit? Yeah, that, that was kind of one of those 
I, I don't want to say bending the rules thing. He, he was a, a big judo aficionado, uh, so much so that he went to Japan to study. And he was surprised uh, about how large a Jewish community there was where he was staying. I believe it was Tokyo, but I'm not going to swear to it. And uh, I, I guess I'm not, I'm, I'm sure the rules for participating in the games have evolved over the years as well. But as uh, <laughs> a, a person, I guess, living in Japan at the time, he qualified to represent Japan, uh, the, the only person from Japan. So uh, to, that, that was pretty cool. Uh, also, uh, I should mention, uh, as I'm talking about the rules for participation, uh, it used to be as, as in Judaism, uh, matrilineal descent was the identifying marker, for lack of a better phrase, as to who was a Jew. But it, it did evolve later on to either parent, which allowed even more people, uh, more athletes to participate. Um, one of the other uh, profiles you did in there, and we, we love them and we also love to make fun of them, is our now current president, Jeff Bucans. And the truth is, Jeff's story of his Maccabee participation is really great and inspiring. So even though he's on here listening and he'll probably be embarrassed, although he's not usually the embarrassed type, but talk about uh, Jeff and his whole journey and what happened with him. Well, Jeff has always been very supportive of my work at the, uh, at the Jewish News. So uh, he was like almost the first person I decided I want to interview when I was doing this book because he was so readily available. Uh, I, I don't think I have to tell the people here his uh, bona fides uh, as far as his father being a, a champion fencer and as far as he being a champion athlete, but obviously it goes beyond that because a lot of people, I'm, I'm guessing the vast majority of the people who have participated in the games, once they're done with the games, they're done with the games. But obviously this is so important to Jeff that he remained in the games uh, in his capacity as an administrator, as an official, uh, which just goes to show how, how much of a grab this had on him. Um, Are you crying, Jeff? Thing. Don't cry, Jeff. <laughs> some very famous people, of course, as it turned out, also participated in the games. I know um, Mark Spitz, it was his first international competition ever. And there is a picture of two of the all-time Maccabee legends which is Tal Brody on the left and Mark Spitz on the right as a uh, looks like a young, I believe he was either 16 or 17 that time. So once again, just um, when guys become that famous and their participation is so important to them, like how does that again, like enhance the overall um, stature of the games, do you think? Well, uh, Spitz participated before his Olympic career. Uh, there are others like uh, Lenny Kraselberg who participated after their Olympic career. So again, like Rayford Johnson, once you get someone who has participated in the Olympics, which is such a, a global high profile event, uh, it, it gives that extra bonus uh, to, this isn't just some uh, sideshow. It, it's a le very legitimate, uh, event if, if these people are going to participate because they wouldn't waste their time. Uh, they have plenty of other opportunities. Uh, th there are some athletes who did have conflicts. Uh, the Maccabea would uh, interfere with some other national event that they were taking place. I know Jay Allen was the oldest interview I had in the book. He was a fencer in the 1953 games. Uh, and he was a championship fencer in England and uh, he uh, missed the following games because it conflicted with the national uh, events and he decided he wanted to do the national events. Uh, Tal Brody here, as I mentioned before, uh, was signed uh, to play in the NBA and he worked it out with the owner of the team who was Jewish, who decided that it was, might be a good idea for him to go to Israel and play. But then uh, he was so taken with it uh, he decided he didn't want to go back to the NBA. He, he told me that it's not like now. If he had signed back then, I think he said the league minimum was $12,000. Uh, when I interviewed him, he said you could be the 12th person on the bench and still pull down $2 million. So that wasn't available. Maybe that would have had a difference uh, if he was in that situation. But again, uh, I don't have to tell everybody here what he's meant to sports in Israel. No, Tal, certainly a big part of all of our lives. And... Um... 
His movie On the Map is great. I'm sure probably everyone on here has probably seen it. In fact, actually, uh, an old friend of mine who I happened to be talking to yesterday, he said, oh, I'm going to, I'm about to watch this movie On the Map. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> I said, not only have I heard of it, but in 2017, I actually, Tal sat next to me and my daughter, Juliet, when, when it was showed to the U.S. delegation, and we actually watched On the Map with him and Tal, I've known for many years and uh, a tremendous person, obviously a huge supporter of our organization, of the Israeli organization, the Israeli Maccabee part, and of course, of, as the, of the state of Israel as well. So when we move forward, uh, in 2009, Bruce Pearl, who was still at the University of Tennessee then, he, uh, he after many years of wanting to be involved and it never happening, he was named the coach of the U.S. team. U.S. Open men's basketball team. And I think that had a huge impact. Talk about uh, Bruce's participation. Well, sure. I mean, again, he, even though he wasn't an athlete, he had a big enough reputation in the United States that if he's going to be involved, A, he's going to be a very demanding coach. And uh, the U.S. basketball team was top notch for many of the years that they participated. Uh, it was a tooth and nail battle with, with Israel most of the time for supremacy in, the, in that sport. So he was, uh, he was also another one I interviewed who was very moved by the experience of, of being in Israel and wanted to, to share. And I, I might be misremembering, but I think his son was one of the members of the team that he coached at the time. Yes, his son, Stephen, was definitely on the team. And his daughter, Jackie, was one of their managers as well. So they made it a whole, uh, a whole family affair. One of Bruce's great lines, when he showed up for the gold medal game, he said he looked out and, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the three refs and he thought he was in big trouble. <laughs> but uh, I, was, I was there at that game, it was a great game. Danny Grunfeld tied it with like five seconds to go or 10 seconds to go. Israel had a chance to win the game and their leading scorer missed. And then the US team um, won that game in overtime. Really, 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 really exciting kind of action. Um, Yesterday was the Hall of Fame, and I know in the early days, uh, one of the things that happened was they were, again, from a financial standpoint, trying to raise money, and Hank Greenberg and Sandy Koufax both appeared at, at dinners to help raise money for the games themselves. So what's the sense you got of how they felt, at least it was, you know, as Jewish athletes to lend their names to the games and help support it in any way that they could? Greenberg supported it early in his career in the 30s. I know he appeared at a dinner. Uh, I don't know exactly what his level of participation he had other than being there. I don't know if he spoke or not. Uh, Koufax uh, in the uh, 60s was, I think he sponsored 10 athletes, if I remember correctly. Uh, and again, <coughs> knowing his reputation as a very reticent person, the fact, just the fact that he was there was, was uh, big news. Again, a major personality in sports lending their recognition to the furtherance of the games. So, uh, I mean, obviously these are two iconic players in Jewish sports uh, for, for each of them, what they did for the high holy days. And as far as uh, anything else goes, uh, it was just a wonderful, uh, you know, again, they, they didn't have to do this. You know, Koufax, both Koufax and Greenberg said that they weren't religious involved that my, Greenberg uh, took off the both of them took off for Yom Kippur out of deference to their parents uh, but uh, individually I don't think they were uh, very religious Jews and in, in that sense of the, in the word but again culturally they were and they realized that this was a big deal so the, hence their participation. Um, back to Lenny Kreiselberg and uh, Lenny Kreiselberg and Jason Lezak. They both, as you said, they were both in the Olympics and then they passed up world championships to, uh, to go to the Maccabee games because they thought it was so important to them. Um, what was the sense that you got from them on their participation doing that? And there's a great picture of them. Lenny well, was, it's funny. Uh, right. Lenny uh, is involved in a lot of work with uh, young people. Uh, and he and Ron Bloomberg were frequent guests, uh, guest hosts at a Jewish camp in, uh, I think it was Pennsylvania uh, and New Jersey uh, teaching sports. Uh, Kreiselberg was from Odessa originally. They moved here when he was very young. Uh, 
<laughs> and I don't know if there is that sense that it would have been back in the 70s of uh, Russians immigrating to the United States or Israel. Uh, so I don't know how he felt about that aspect of uh, being denied the opportunity to uh, to worship as, as the freedom of worship as he would like. Uh, as far as Lee's echoes, I did not speak with him directly, so I'm not really sure uh, about his, obviously his level of commitment is very high and he thought enough of the uh, Maccabea games to give up another chance of uh, participating in the Olympics. But I, on a, a selfish level, and I hate to uh, talk negatively in any way about it, I'm, I'm wondering if some of the athletes who participated in the Maccabea after their Olympics career uh, were just feeling a little pressure from the younger people who were coming up and realized they might not have a shot at that uh, extra medal, that extra glory, uh, and, and decided not to participate in further Olympic games for the opportunity to participate in the Maccabea games. Um, move on to a, uh, a little five year period that was that not great things happened in the Maccabea games. The first one, of course, in 1997, uh, when the famous bridge collapsed outside the stadium as people were, were waiting to walk in. Yet you went pretty extensively on that in the book and all the repercussions that happened afterwards. So what do you think the general feeling and, and just like talk about that a little? Uh, there's a lot of information on that. So that's why that got a lot of, uh, a lot of space. Uh, uh, that was the most horrible thing you could imagine other than perhaps the Munich massacre uh, in, the, in the Olympics. Uh, but th this was at the outset of the games when the athletes were, were high on the opening ceremonies and walking into the stadium so proudly and to have that happen so immediately uh, must have been devastating. Uh, the, the Australian contingent were the, was the one that was impacted the most. Uh, it, it, it's hard to talk about, you know, when I think about it now, how, how bad it was for all these athletes falling from that distance into, I, I can't even imagine why there were to be toxic water below them so that not only were they hurt in the actual bridge collapse, but for weeks and months and years afterwards, they were suffering the effects of being in that situation. Uh, People went to jail. People uh, were brought up on, on civil charges. It was, it was talking with different people who were there and, and each, you know, this one might've been in the stadium and was waiting, wondering what is going on? Why is everything taking so long? Waiting to hear getting conflicting reports. Uh, some thought it was sabotaged by Arab components that were uh, in, involved. So it was a, a terrible thing and you know, the Australian contingent was wondering if they should pull out. And I can only imagine what the administrators of that Maccabea were going through the decisions they had to made on the spur of the moment to continue, not to continue, how to honor those who had fallen. It was just a, a horrible scene. Well, I can tell you because I was there that um, I mentioned this to you the other day that uh, that was when I was a writer at the Jewish Times in Philadelphia and 14 newspapers around the country hired me to be like a one man syndicate to sort of cover the games and I was standing on the infield and just as you were just explaining, like all of a sudden the opening ceremony started and Kerry Strug and Mickey Berkowitz were lighting the torch and people were wondering why are they doing that when there's no athletes in the building and helicopters circulating around the top and you could hear sirens going off and you could see the security people running all over the place. Unfortunately for me, I didn't speak Hebrew, so I didn't know exactly what was going on. But then and sadly, we all did discover what was happening in my... Uh, my good Israeli friend drove me to Kafar Maccabea, where I was actually interviewing people who were covered in mud and who were still all wet and dirty and talking about the horror, what happened. And then the next day, there was a huge meeting on whether the game should be canceled. I forget. It was one of the main Israeli. It was either the president or the prime minister. Some, maybe somebody else here can remember who it was who came to the meeting. And of course, it was a big thing for them. They didn't want they didn't want the games to stop and it was such a tragedy, but how do you go on and how do you play? So um, if I remember correctly, it was, they suspended all play for one day and then the games did continue after that, but it was certainly a, 
certainly a horrible event and one that, you know, we still honor the people who sadly um, died in that tragedy. And I, I think the lead I wrote in my stories was people involved in the Maccabea movement think that um, it doesn't get nearly enough publicity. And now suddenly it was a main story on CNN and on, was on the front page of newspapers around the world, but not for a good reason, for a bad reason, which as we know, sometimes happens in the new in the uh, in the news business overall. Um, we move on from that to the next games, which was 2001. And the second intifada was raging in Israel at the time. And um, lots of back and forth on whether it, the games were going to happen, were canceled, put back on, we're going, we're not going. Just talk about the uh, impression you got from people who you talked to on how that ended up did happening and did go on and the games were played in a little bit of a more of a shortened form. Well, I'm going to actually on this one because I interviewed him so much on it. I'm actually going to defer to Jeff on this. And if Jeff would kindly uh, say a few words about that, you know, since he was there and involved so heavily, I'd rather have him talk about it since he is here. How you doing, Ron? I'm sorry about that. I was uh, someone was calling me at the exact moment. What am I supposed to talk about now? Oh, the the uh, oh. 2001 oh. games, the intifada, and the decisions of uh, the different contingents on uh, oh. how to go about. I was. I, I think I could speak. I think Jed also is here. Could speak to it as well. Um, I, I was a member of the executive committee, and the executive committee initially voted. I think it was 21 to nothing, uh, not to go. Uh, we just felt it was too dangerous. And subsequently, we were on a, a conference call with some big shots. I think Malcolm Honline and I um, uh, forgot a couple other people, some really big names. And we sort of were given the impression that, if, guys, if you don't go, there's not going to be any games. And if there's not going to be any games, you might never have the games again. So we sort of had a change of heart. And I think Ron and Bob Spivak actually flew to Israel. And uh, eventually, the decision was made that we were going to go and the, the team was uh, significantly uh, smaller. Uh, Jed, are you here, Jed? Maybe you want to add yes. to that? Yes, I will add. Uh, first of all, Ron, congratulations on the book. It's um, really a terrific book and I refer to it quite often. Um, right. It was uh, uh, some of the top dignitaries, politicians, as well as leaders from around the world who were on that phone call encouraging us to, to go. And what we did was send Jordan Weinstein and Ron Carner to check it out and to ask all the important questions in terms of security and safety, because that was on everybody's mind at the time. And I have to say how grateful that the Israelis were that we stepped up and participated in the numbers. So we held it together. It was a smaller team, but it was a wonderful experience that we saw a side of Israel that was very kind and, and appreciative. And I'll add that, you know, of course, once we got there, security did seem a little stronger than usual, but there wasn't any issues, nothing happened. Everybody had just as a great a time as, you know, I've been blessed to have been there five times in, in the games and everyone had just a great time that time as they did the other four times I was there. And, um, you know, ultimately it was, it was obviously good. Who knows, who knows what would have happened if we didn't go and, and for the future of the game. So, so on one level, I really believe that we kind of saved the games. So it was a great thing that, that we did. And it was, look, it was, there was, that was one of those, to me, it was classic. There was no right, no wrong decision. It was just, you know, you went with what your heart, what your gut told you. That's what you did. And that's what you felt. Like I said, I, I was fine. I went, I had young kids at the time, but I wasn't worried. And I was, I was happy and proud to go and, had a great time and had a great team and all that kind of stuff. So, so that was all good. So Jed, great to see you as well. Yes. Good job with this. <laughs> um, Ron, the next one I want to get to uh, before we have a couple other quickie subjects is Dave Blackburn. Uh, Dave was one of our uh, great softball pitchers for years. He was, he probably participated as an athlete more than anybody else. Um, he also participated in a lot of the um, Pan Am games where I'm not sure if you noticed, but Dave was a large fellow who's uh, in the South American realm. They called him El Gordo Grande. 
Um, he was so well known down there and he was absolutely amazing too. And of course, as we all know, you know, he then was in a, on the way to a softball tournament, was in a horrible car accident, ended up losing part of his leg. And then a couple of years later, probably due to situations that happened with that, he ended up passing away. But um, you had stuff about him. So if you want to just talk about him for a couple of minutes. Sure. Uh, like you say, he was like one of these gentle giants. And again, this is where Jeff comes in because uh, he spoke so lovingly about uh, their relationship about he was on uh, Jeff was on a phone call to his wife uh, when this guy comes into the, the hallway wearing a wrestler robe and uh, <laughs> yelling and screaming and just having a good time and uh, Jeff said uh, bye honey I love you I gotta go and they immediately bonded uh, he was one of these literally larger than life figures who I, I believe the, the rule at the time is you're only allowed to participate in three sets of games to allow other people to have the chance. But because uh, Blackburn was a pitcher, uh, the most important position on the team, uh, they bent the rules for him a little and he participated and I believe it was six games. So, uh, and, and yeah, the, the, the accident, although it, uh, had uh, the devastating impact on his body, didn't have a similar impact on his spirit. He wanted to go to the, the, the games. Uh, he was, uh, Jeff said that they were gonna get him there no matter what it took. I uh, threw out the first pitch, uh, the ceremonial first pitch uh, for the game in the last uh, uh, Maccabee he attended. And it was just a sad situation for, for someone like this and all his um, friends, obviously. Before the 93 games, I was actually a writer at the Jewish Times in Philadelphia at the time. And our softball team, um, before they were leaving for Israel, played an exhibition game against a team called DC Tire, who was the defending fast pitch national champions at the time. Uh, a playground kind of near where I live, not that it mattered, I would have went there anyway, but called Max Myers Playground, Northeast Philadelphia. They had the game there. Dave was absolutely outstanding. I believe we won either 4-2 or 4-3, and I'll say we, and that was one of the first times I saw that, and, and again, just a, uh, a, a figure on the mound, um, unlike any other, just watching him pitch, boy, could he throw, incredibly competitive, loved Maccabee, of course, everyone knows, he was, we all have pins and shirts and hats, but he wore that hat for years that didn't have any more room for any more pins on it that he walked around with. And one of my personal proudest moments ever was he called me a legend once. That meant the world to me because I absolutely love Dave. Um, getting back to uh, today being um, Holocaust Remembrance Day. So it says in the book there too, that um, there was 47 former Olympian, Olympians who actually had died in concentration camps, but there was a couple survivors who went on. One was, Ben Helfgott, who was a lightweight, uh, lightweight weightlifting champion who represented Great Britain in 1956 and in the 60 Olympics. So people who did that and survived. Do you remember anything about what you wrote about, about Ben? I, I'll, I'll admit I, I don't per, per se about uh, him, uh, sadly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, as you say, the, there's a list of Olympians who were lost in the Holocaust that I could not find a similar list for uh, members of the Maccabea games uh, because again, the record keeping at the time uh, was, was uh, not great. So as far as identifying people who played, who remained in Europe and who uh, subsequently died. Uh, but there are stories about uh, countries who participated in the early games when Nazism was coming to full froth, uh, who decided not to return to their countries, even though the chief uh, British magistrate, Lord Lord uh, Melcott, uh, if I remember that correctly, uh, said, you know, it's great having you here, but we expect you to go back to your countries. Uh, and they didn't, although they, I think it was, uh, I forget which, Bulgaria perhaps, uh, the entire group stayed there, but they sent back their equipment. <laughs> That was nice. And another one, which was a great one, and he's still alive today, thank God, is Israeli Shul Ladadny. I think that's how you say his name. He still holds the Olympic uh, race walking record. 
He was a he was a survivor from Munich. He was a two-time Olympian. He still holds the world record for the 50-mile walk. And um, he set all kinds of other records, too. He was a survivor of Bergen-Belsen. And he survived the Munich massacre, too. He jumped out a window when that happened there. When he And um, he is also a professor uh, of engineering and management at Ben Gurion University. He's written a dozen books, 120 papers, and reportedly speaks nine languages. So it's incredible, you know, when you think about it. Um, you know, what, what was lost, I mean, besides just life and potential for, for what would have gone on in the world and all that is, is just, a, it's just an incredible thing for, for everyone. So I don't know, as you, as you look back, so what was the experience like for you writing this book, getting to maybe know about something that you didn't really know that much about? Well, it was a lot of fun uh, for most of it. It was a little more intense at the end when I, uh, anyone who's written a book knows the editing process. Uh, if it's a good editing process, it takes a long time, a lot of back and forth, a lot of uh, fact checking, a couple of facts, unfortunately, fell, fell through. Uh, but for the most part, it was, it was a real kick talking. The, the interviews were my favorite part of the book. Uh, rather than just reporting on the game results, and because uh, that was basically the same kind of information for for each of the games, but but talking to the people like Jeff, like uh, uh, I, I understand Roy Solomon's here, talking uh, to him, talking to Carol Benjamin and, and Tal, uh, <laughs> to hear their stories, especially early on, without that connection with Israel and how that connection was made and the impact it had on their lives moving forward. It was, it was quite, quite interesting. Uh, I really enjoyed that aspect of it the most. Um, you also wrote an op-ed piece, I noticed, for Israeli media on racism in the games, on what makes people Jewish, on, on that aspect, and who should be included and who didn't. What was your sort of uh, take on that? What was the gist there? Uh, the gist was somebody said that the games were unfair because of uh, the, the racist aspects. But in, in fact, if you were a citizen of Israel, you could participate whether you're Jewish or not. And they did have some Arab Jewish citizens who did participate in some of these games. So my, my take was the games were not racist. They're not a, exclusionary in that regard. Uh, I don't remember what the, 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 the person who took the opposite side, what his bone to pick was. Uh, as far as was he upset that these are just Jewish athletes? I, I don't know. But again, they were not just Jewish athletes, especially if you were uh, in a uh, citizen of Israel. So uh, yeah, that was another one of these things that way after the book came out was uh, when, when they asked me to do this. So I was kind of stunned that this was even an issue anymore. Um, and I see here you're working on a project now called On Deck to History. What exactly is that about? So we'll all... Uh... Uh, that is literally what it says. It's people who were on deck for uh, famous uh, events. Uh, one of my first interviews that I'm unfortunately with uh, the loss of Hank Aaron recently has is, is been put on hold for a little bit at least. Dusty Baker was in the on deck circle when Aaron hit his 715th home run. So these people have a unique literally a unique perspective on what happened. The, uh, there are some events that like Aaron's was a long time in coming. It was an eventuality that would happen at, at one point or another. Uh, then there is uh, the Mike Piazza home run in the Mets first home game uh, after 9-11. Robin Ventura was in the on deck circle for that. So I have a list of people who were uh, watching uh, these things as they unfolded. One that I really don't think I'll get is uh, Willie Mays, who was on deck when Ralph uh, Branke gave up the home run to Bobby Thompson. Uh, I read, uh, maybe it's uh, just apocryphal, that uh, when they asked him about it afterwards, he said he was just glad that it wasn't left up to him to do it if, if Thompson had uh, made out. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so that, that that's really in the very early stages of that. Well, that sounds like a great book. So a couple of things. One, Jason Lezak will actually be our guest. It was rescheduled. He is going to be a guest on our next Maccabi Zoom, which is going to be Thursday night, tomorrow night, the President's Forum with Jeff Bukans at, uh, at 8 p.m. And somebody else wrote in here that there is a movie about Dave Blackburn called The King and Me, just completed, 
and should be out within a week or so as well. That's something that I would be watching for sure. So um, just incredible stuff from you. Um, anything else you can think of you'd like to throw in there stuff that we didn't get to? Well, one of the things I, I was disappointed in is not actually being able to go to the games. I was hoping that I would find some uh, funding from the uh, paper at the time to send me to actually cover the games. That would, that would have been, uh, I guess, in the 2013 games is because uh, I wasn't there for the 20. I was no longer with the paper for 2017. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. Uh, I am a little embarrassed to admit I have never been to Israel. So I thought that would have been a real uh, key life event had I been able to do that. Um, well, again, as almost everyone here can attest, you still got time. Israel is not going anywhere. And um, 2022 is only right around the corner. So uh, we certainly would love to have you. I'd like to also open it up if anybody has a question that they would like to ask of Ron. Shifty, there's one question already in the chat from Peter Kessel. Uh, Peter wondered, did any of the athletes murdered in Munich previously participate in Maccabi? Yeah, offhand, I, I don't know. I, I can't recall. I'm guessing there were, but uh, I just don't have that information at my fingertips. I, I can respond to that. Uh, this is Jed. Uh, David Berger, who is from Shaker Heights, Ohio, played for, he weightlifted for the United States in the Maccabee Games uh, and went on to make Aliyah. And unfortunately, we lost him in the, in the Munich massacre. Thanks, Jed. Wasn't somebody else who uh, is on here is from Shaker Heights, Ohio? Cleveland, the <laughs> other side of the tracks. <laughs> and that would be that gentleman right there, Jed Margolis. So I don't know if anyone else has any, anybody else has anything. Um, it's fascinating hearing stories, seeing someone who, who got in there and got down and dirty with all the details of what we do. Um, it's a difficult chore you did. The book was great. I read the whole thing. And again, I loved the uh, main, I loved the profiles um, as it went through it and seeing all the history of the games and, uh, you know, where, how we got to where we are today is always fascinating to see. One so, of the things that did uh, amuse me a little bit, uh, it amused me, I'm sure it didn't amuse the athletes who uh, participated. Uh, again, as I mentioned very early on, the, the record keeping was very iffy and a lot of the results were written by hand. So you had some uh, penmanship problems that changed, uh, made some numbers difficult to read. And when, when you're a, an athlete on that level, you know, uh, if, if you finish something uh, in a zero and they make it a six, uh, because of a slip of a pen, you know, you're not very happy with that kind of result. Ron, congratulations again on this book. We spoke quite a bit, but this is the first time I see you in person, and it's really nice seeing you, and especially uh, nice seeing a lot of my friends that I don't get to see that often. I see all of them on here, and Maccabi is a, just a wonderful organization, and I think you covered it extremely well, Ron, and hopefully you're going to get to the games in 22 got to figure out a way for you to get there. I'm sorry, I don't see it. Who, who, who is this? Is this Roy? It was yeah. Roy Thalman, yes. Yeah. Roy, hey, very nice to meet you finally. Yeah, very nice to, with me. Very nice generous to see you. Time. you. It was too. a pleasure. It was a pleasure being part of the book. Uh, and uh, yeah, I see a lot of other guys. Bob Spivak down there. Where, where are you, Bob? It's the only time I see you is on a program like this. <laughs> uh, obviously, Bob's a important uh, part of the Maccabea goes way back. We go back as friends, as associates in North America. Terrific guy. And I see just many of you on there. Jeff and Jed Margolis and Freddie Schoenfeld. Freddie, you go back a long way too. So I just want to say hello to all of you because it's been a pleasure having you uh, as part of my life. And hello and, to and, you, Roy. I just want to make a, a point. Uh, when I did speak to Ron and Bob, and Jeff also, of course, it's a different perspective coming from someone who has to oversee all these things with the problems and headaches that the athletes don't, you know, the athletes just go about their business. Uh, they're involved as it should be with, with their performances. And I don't think they know 
uh, the full extent or appreciate the full extent of, of what people like Ron and Bob and Jeff have to go through to make these things possible. That is, that is so true that, uh, you know, it's, it's a daunting, when, when we look back at it, when you look back and see how many people this organization has taken to Israel, how many lives it's changed, how many marriages have happened, and, um, you know, what we do as a group, what we try to do individually, and then what happens as a group, it's, it looks like it's a monumental task. And I know the hierarchy sometimes, I don't know how it's going to get done, but for many, many years, it, it does get done, and it gets done great. And um, kudos to everybody who's been a part of it, you know, throughout the years, everybody. Uh, it's an amazing group of people. So with that, um, once again, I'll promote tomorrow night that Jason Lezak will be on, on the President's Forum with Jeff Bukans. Many other great things coming. 